Okay, hello everybody. It's pretty quiet in here. <laughs> so, um, my talk today is how I met your password. Uh, basically covering um, a few things around password cracking, primarily from the offensive side of things, why um, it's sometimes becoming more difficult, uh, mistakes that we can be making. Uh, before, sorry, before I continue, can, can everyone hear me? Yeah. Working all right, okay, thanks. And uh, also some attacks that, uh, some of them are not new, they just haven't, we just haven't seen them for a while, but they're still very good, they can work very well. Especially if you're new to uh, to cracking passwords, there's a few things that have uh, evolved since they were first made. Then also what to do for the uh, the slow algorithms, the ones that are taking more that are more difficult to crack. And then finally, some new information about uh, WPA2 attacks that I'm sure you recently heard of. Uh, that was released by Atom at Hashcat, so we'll have a look at that as well and how uh, it's going to help us a lot with. Uh, cracking those Wi-Fi pass passwords. Of course, um, everything shown here is uh, for you to use in your work. I assume no one would ever want to use it for anything bad. Um, that thought would never cross your minds. So uh, nothing mentioned here would, would be, uh, should be used for that. Um, the key is to try and make things stronger and more secure by finding what's wrong with them and trying to fix those holes. That's where these approaches are coming from. Um, I will do the questions because uh, it's going to be pretty close to lunchtime when I finish. And uh, so what I'm going to do is if you have any questions when I'm finished, then you can come up and we can discuss it. Um, then, Because I don't want to keep those of you who uh, don't have any questions and may be hungry and will want to get to lunch. So just having a quick look at the outline then. Uh, why you're failing, just having a brief look at, uh, at why it's getting more difficult to crack passwords. Leaks, best friend or worst foe. So uh, there's quite a bit of leaks out there. And um, we're going to just have a, a brief discussion on whether or not they're actually working for us or they're not working for us. As somebody who does password audits, does it make your life easier? Does it make it more difficult? Um, some people may feel that uh, with leaks becoming somewhere apparent, there's no, it's harder for them to, f to crack passwords because companies are securing pretty well against the ones out there. We'll have a look at that as well. Then some attack methods, uh, Markov, TMSS, and Prince. Um, some of these, those of you who have been cracking passwords for a while may recognize. Um, they are still very much uh, capable of increasing the amount of passwords that you can crack if you use them properly. Attacking phrases in other languages. So uh, we often just seem to default to cracking passwords in English, but uh, if you come from different countries, different places, um, there's different kinds of passwords you can crack. Emoji may land up uh, in a in a uh, hash somewhere, and you want to be able to crack that. So we'll have a look at that as well. Cracking heavy-duty algorithms, and then new WPA2 attacks without uh, client interaction, and then questions finally. Okay, so why are you why you're failing? So what's uh, been happening a lot recently? I'm sure you've seen it out there in the news. Is that well, we, we, we're seeing two things increasing a lot. We're seeing uh, real-time password blacklists finding themselves into applications, into third-party tools, um, major leaks like uh, Have I Been Pwned, releasing the SHA-1 hashes that companies can then query in real time and say, well, the password you're trying to set is not uh, secure. Try and use something else. Then the user education side of things. So there's always there's an, an increase in the amount of education that's been given to users every year. Unfortunately, passwords are still relatively sec secure, and, and I think they're always going to be. But the level does increase as time goes by. As a new generation starts using the internet, um, they, they're a bit more privy to those attacks that can happen. They're a bit more aware of what insecure passwords can be, and so they up the level a bit more as they start using systems out there. And then, of course, better hashing algorithms also um, have come to the fore. And so that also makes it more difficult to, to crack passwords sometimes as well. Okay, salts, increased use of salts. So from a developer point of view, uh, a, a lot more salting of passwords is being done and stronger and longer salts as well. Uh, unfortunately, um, sometimes there's salts being used when hashes are created, but they're so small and so weak that uh, they may as well not be there at all. 
on the other hand, you have some people who are building very robust, very good applications that are salting those hashes very well, making them very difficult for somebody to be able to crack. And then increased computing power, resulting in better uptake of slower or intensive hashes. So certain hashing algorithms that were once considered too difficult to use because of the fact that they would have been too slow, the processing power to be able to, to do multiple transactions or multiple events in hashing a, a, a password. Um, that was an issue in the past. It's becoming less of an issue now. Of course, the more difficult algorithms that have been introduced may still also be causing um, systems to slow down. But the fact is that processing power is, is getting faster and faster and faster, and so more advanced uh, um, hashing algorithms can be used. Just the note at the bottom there, of course, that the inverse is true. So the more processing power that we have to, cr to use stronger algorithms, we have also stronger processing power to crack pass passwords as well. So <laughs> the two tend to rise together, but the fact is that we are seeing a lot more use of better hashes or better hashing algorithms out there than we did five years ago, maybe even four years ago or less. People also moving away from the easy hashes, mostly moving away from the easy, hash easy hashes. Unfortunately, we still see uh, some people trying to do authentication with MD5 in, in databases or SHA-1. Um, if you're doing that, then I would highly recommend you, uh, well, don't cha change it now, because if you get up and go, we'll know. But <laughs> as soon as possible, you need to, uh, you need to get off hashes like that there. They're pr pr pretty tr trivial to uh, to crack, and uh, even if they're salted, they're still pretty trivial to crack these days as well. So, um, MD5 basically belongs in the history books, or maybe for the odd check if a file that you've got matches a different file that you've got. That's about as far as uh, as I would use it these days. When it comes to any form of authentication, um, you want MD5 out the window fast, and you want SHA-1 out the window fast as well. Okay, uh, leaks. So leaks are creating awareness for uh, better password security. Um, basically, every time they go in the news, people see these, this terrible leak has happened and the passwords that came out of it were horrible. Um, also related to our previous slide because often those leaks um, are easy to crack. And uh, just one point I'd like to make here too also is that there's no point moving to a stronger algorithm um, you can go all the way up to bcrypt if you want to. And then your security and the rest of your system and application infrastructure is so bad that it's it's pretty easy to get hold of the hashes and start working on them. So you know you, you need to look at both sides because I've seen, um, for example, on a on a pen test, you can get hold of hashes pretty quickly in an application. Um, so yes, the box was ticked to say we're not using MD5 and SHA-1 or anything that's insecure like that or fast to crack like that. But the downside is that they weren't kept securely. They weren't, the application had no way of protecting them. Everything else that should have holistically protected those hashes was not there. So back to the leaks. Um, there can be query to prevent password reuse. I'm sure many of you have seen those lists going out there that uh, you can query. There's APIs. You can download uh, the SHA-1s and other forms of the hashes. And what this is doing is that it's, um, it's allowing websites and applications to actually say to the user, well, the password that you've entered, you should, please don't choose this one, it's been leaked somewhere. Okay. Now that's very good, but it's not very effective if you haven't switched to a stronger hashing algorithm and it's not possible to attack the application and get the hashes anyway. Because otherwise you're just telling users to pick a new password when the rest of the system is, is insecure as well. So leaks, uh, best friend or worst foe. So. Leaks give us good word lists for, for cracking, right? Because they're real pass passwords. They're not ones we've guessed. Maybe someone's chosen it. Maybe they didn't chose it. It's real world passwords that people have used. We can get statistics from those. Uh, we can look up and do all sorts of fancy analysis and see, well, for this particular site, these are what the users are doing. Uh, when it comes to HR sites, this is what they're doing. When it comes to uh, social sites or, or the dating sites. This is how users are choosing their passwords, common words used here and there. And then we can also block or ban these leaked passwords, as I mentioned, using the various APIs. So what is the downside? 
Well, the downside is that uh, many of our word lists, when we're cracking passwords, now become negated. Because if you've got uh, a few billion passwords that users have chosen, chances are all those nice word lists you've got worth 10 or 15 gigs, at least 80% or more are going to be in that list. So it's, it's kind of bringing down what you used to have to work with when it comes to cracking passwords in your, in your, word, in your word lists. The user experience in entry. So I don't know if any of you have used uh, any sites that are using these uh, these ban lists to block certain passwords that, that you can use. Okay, It can be a bit frustrating because you're typing and it's saying no. You're trying something else and it's saying no. Okay, Those leaks are pretty big. So the chances of getting or choosing a password that it's gonna, that's going to be in that list is, is pretty good. Okay, so what you have is two things are happening. Either your usability of the site is affected because users are like, well, I just don't know what to choose, you know? Keeping in mind that users don't sit all day planning what's the strongest password that they're going to pick. So it becomes frustrating for, for them. And then the other problem that happens with, um, with that is that some sites have a limit. So by the fifth or sixth time that it doesn't accept something, it'll give in and say, okay, you know, because we don't want to frustrate you anymore, so we'll accept what you've got, but you need to work on it or change it at some other time. So now what's happened is a weaker password has been, has been allowed in, into the system again. It also does not re-educate the user. So telling a user that uh, password one, two, three should not be used because it's in a leak doesn't provide them with any kind of education of how to choose a stronger password. It just tells them that, well, you can't use this one, try again. So they try password four, five, six, and they get the same thing. They try password seven, eight, nine. Okay? By the time they're up to 10,000 or so, they still haven't been taught anything <laughs> about how to construct a secure passwords. So yes, these leaks have pros that, that uh, they're making them useful on both sides for those cracking passwords, for those who need to have secure passwords on their sites. At the same time, though, there's certain things that need to be addressed. Um, simply querying those APIs and blocking users is not sufficient to get this thing to work. It's going gonna, it's gonna to become frustrating. You, business is going to ultimately force you to put some kind of a, a, a comp compromise in there. And then, of course, um, the fact is that, and as I'm sure you, some of you know, the case of those SHA-1 lists that are out there, I think 99, was it 99.5% are correct? I think, or more by now? 99 point something high. So already people wanting to crack passwords will have those in their dictionaries. They'll be able to work with them. We'll touch on that a bit later on. So those are not going to be affecting them. They're not going to be trying them as false, as false positives when they're looking to create a word list to attack hashes. And then finally, the user education is a, is a problem as well. So to make password audits effective, then your word list need to be efficient. And uh, I think that's a given. But even if you've got the processing power, you don't want to just throw word lists that are wasting time. So if you know that a particular site or system is already using or querying a certain number of leaks to check if the password's in there, get them out of the word list that you're using because otherwise you're just sending stuff that you know is not going to be in there. One way to do that is the, the RLI tool from Hashcat Utilities. Very simple. You give it a, uh, a word list and then you give it a second word list. It'll then give you the output of the difference between the two, right? So what is not in the one, what in your word list was not in the other one. In this case, what in my word list wasn't in the pwned passwords. Um, what you may want to do there is remove special characters, drop the case down, because um, you, you're going to use rules ult ultimately to attack the passwords later on. So there's no point trying to compare those at this point in time. What you want to do is get a nice streamlined word list that hasn't got the leaks that you know that particular target was excluding from allowing users to, to, to use when you want to audit it. Understand how users will bypass these pwned password checks and then also try and make your password attacks using your rules and your hybrid attacks and, and that which we'll touch on just now. Um, get them to try and, and follow these types of patterns that the users are using, right? So, for example, in this example, June at 2018, July 2018 and June at 2019, Right, the user may have tried to set those as a password and the site saying, no, it's in a leak, you can't use it. No, it's being leaked, you can't use it. All right, so what is he going to do? He's going to try June of 2019, 2019, and maybe that one is not in, in the list. I'm not saying this is not, a, it's an example, but 
if it's not in the list now, the site will accept it, but is that any more secure than the other two, right? There's very simple rules in both John and Hashcat when cracking that would give you the output of uh, June 2019, 2019, having just the one password candidate of June at 2019 there. So think about how users are going to think and how they're going to work around this because ultimately that's what users are pretty good at. The ones who stick around long enough, I remember us saying earlier some are just going to be frustrated and go somewhere else, but those who stick it out will find a way to find a word that a password that isn't in that leaked list and then they will continue. And it's not necessarily meaning it's going to be a secure password. It just means it may not be in a word list that is floating around on the internet some way or that has been leaked. Okay, common password attacks. So we, we, we're not going to go into detail on the very common uh, common stuff. So um, I assume most of you know that. Uh, you're using the word list, very easy. You run your particular tool of choice and you give it a dic dictionary list. The brute force, well, that's not, not, not a dictionary, but trying different characters, different sets of characters. Built-in attack types, like the hybrid attacks, the combination attacks, okay? These are basically using word lists and rules, or word lists and brute force, or combining word lists t together. These have been around for very long. They still work very well. We're not going to go into detail on them. And then rules and rules files. Um, so these things are still out there. They're still uh, being used very much. But let's have a look at some of the other ones that aren't as, uh, as simple as, uh, as these ones. Um, and some of them have been around, as I said, for, uh, for a while. Some of them are, are quite good. Um, we're going to we're going to look at Markov, TMSS, and uh, Prince. So the layout I'm going to use: the blue box tells you what it does, the green box tells you what an example of what the output would be, and then the yellow box is basically just the uh, the commands that you can be using. Now, the Markov attack um, a few years ago, you, you used to need quite a bit, of, quite a few tools to get it to work, or certain tools to plug into your uh, or output to your hash cracking for it to work. These days it's built into most of the hash crackers. So for example, Hashcat automatically does a Markov when you're trying to brute force. So what is, what is Markov? It's a statistical prediction or selection of the next character based on the previous character and or including the position of that character. Okay, so for those of you who haven't heard of Markov before, um, it's a, he's, he's a mathematician, came up with these very interesting uh, algorithms. And, and Markov chains are basically tables that try to predict with some kind of certainty, sometimes very good certainty, um, what is going to be next in the chain. Okay? So I'll give you an example. If I, if I use the sentence, uh, um, Humpty Dumpty sat on a, right? Okay, your brain knows, because it's seen it before, that statistically the next word is wool. Right, you're not going to suddenly, your brain's not going to just pull out car or bus or something, okay? Because it's been trained, you've seen that sentence many times in your life and you know what comes after it. So Markov works in a similar way. We can take certain words, sentences, phrases from books, from publications, from anything really, and we can work out that if I have one or two words, what comes next statistically, right? Um, if I have one word, what's after it? If I have two words, what's after that? Uh, and you can group them, it can become quite complex as it goes on. But the fact is that it gives you a pretty strong prediction that you can use when cracking passwords so that you're not trying things that it would have a low chance of working. So if you look at the green box there, if you had the characters H-E-L, um, in the English dictionary there's a 90% chance that there's an L, 80% chance of an O. I, I left out the P, but that would have been in there as well. We have only a 5% chance that the next character would have been a, been a W. So if you were trying to crack a password and using these as candidates to see if it matches the hash that you're trying to, to crack, W would be the very last thing you would be trying, H-E-L-W. It's not saying you won't try it, but statistically you want that to be at the bottom to increase your chances of cracking a password closer to the top. TMSS. Um, so TMSS takes a word list and provides insertion rules to insert the word into preset positions of each word, right? So TMSS, what it basically does is it will take a it'll take a word list. It'll take um, create rules to insert. If you look on the right there in the output box, right, I've given it the word hello. 
Now, what Timesis outputs is that it's it's outputting. If you don't know what that is, you're looking at it's um, it's uh, it's the rules for Hashcat, right? So when Hashcat sees this, it knows to apply certain rules. So here it's t telling it that in position zero of whatever input word I'm getting, put an H. In position one, put an E. In position L, and so on and so forth. Right? When you, when it's done that, it moves on the next one. So now in position one, put the H. In position two, put the E. In position three, put the L, and so on and so forth. So it'll carry on doing that all the way down, inserting um, this particular word into every character that it can find in the target word. Right. And then you will be left with a bunch of rules that you can use as output, and you can feed it uh, to Hashcat as a rule file on a dictionary. It, it can work very well. It can insert things that uh, you may not, 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 not have thought about. Um, obviously, it can also get pretty big, depending what you're feeding it and how, how big the rules are that come out. It's up to you to, uh, to see what your appetite is. Um, if you've got quite a few GPUs and you want to keep them quite busy, well, give it a good word list that, and give it quite a few rules. It'll be happy to go on with that. Okay, then the Prince attack. Uh, the Prince attack uh, is stands for prop probability infinite chained elements. So what this word does is it takes one word list and it creates and chains and returns words, right? They can fit into certain positions there. So, for example, we input a word list and we're outputting assuming a length of six, right? So if we are putting assuming a length of six, what the Prince attack will do is it'll output three plus three character words to give us a length of six. Okay, so it builds a table of, of all the words, indexes them, knows what the lengths are, and then it starts outputting based on that table. So to give us a six length word, it'll also output a four plus two character word. It'll output a five plus one character word, and so on and so forth. It'll keep doing this. So that gives you a good way to generate quite a nice word list that you can use for that. So the command line there, also pretty simple. Once you've compiled uh, uh, the Prince binary, it's uh, PP64, you give it a word list, or you can give it constraints about where it should start and stop generating these passwords for you. So um, if we go to the next slide looking at prints, so there's an example, right? I've got a words.txt file, and I've uh, just put three words in there, hello, Bob, and airplane. Now I'm going to ask prints to generate words on this. Now I'm not going to give it cons constraints, I'm going to let it start from the minimum, which is three characters, and work its way up. And if you look at the output, you can see what it's doing here. So for three characters, it outputted Bob, because Bob is a three character word. Then it went to four, well, hello fits that. Then it put airplane, then it started adding. Now if you notice as it goes on, um, I'm not sure if you can see it in this, in this example, but one thing you need to keep in mind, that you may land up with some du duplicates here that you'll need to filter out before you go on, because it's gonna keep on adding, and it may switch them around, and then you're gonna have these duplicate words coming in here too. So it's outputting a whole lot of possible words that you can use for that as well. Just some other tools to mention. Um, there's the combinator attack. Uh, this is done by most tools by default, but if you want to create combined word lists for yourself, um, there's a combinator binary. It, it's, it's also part of the Hashcat tools. And it's very simple. You, you give it two files, it joins them. You give it three files, it joins all the words in those files and gives you output, right? So a very nice way to do that. So, um, you know, for example, if you've got a, if you've got a, a word list with a bunch of uh, nouns in it and a word list with a bunch of verbs, you want to join them all together, you can use Combinator to do that. And then uh, Huresort is a tool I wrote, I think, in 2015 or so, basically just to help manage the word list that you have to make them more efficient, to make them easier um, for you to work with. Sometimes we have we tend to add to our word list to such a degree without cleaning them that we're sitting with quite big word lists that are actually ineffective. And one very surefire way of a word list becoming ineffective is if it's got entries that it should be doing with rules instead of just the base word itself. Right, so for example, if your word list contains um, at hello, okay, you don't need to have the at in your word list because there are rules and rules files that, that are gonna tell the cracking software to add an at before every word and so on and so forth. So you want to get those out to keep the word list nice and, and, and small and as, as lean as possible. 
Um, there's various options. I've just shown two there. Uh, one of them is to take away the the sentences. So if you've got a word list with a bunch of sentences and you don't want them in there, you can say uh, no sentence, which basically compacts everything into one line without uh, one string, without any spaces. The wordify option will do the opposite. It'll basically break each word up, each word in the sentence up into a new word on a new line. There's some various other options you can look at using there as well. Um, it is a Python script, so um, feel free to change it or do whatever you want to it um, to make it work for what you need. It's not the only tool that can do that out there, so if you, uh, if you want to look on Google as well for something else that fits your needs, uh, then you should do that. The, the key here is to make sure that your word lists are very well maintained and, and very efficient when you're cracking passwords. Otherwise, you're wasting resources with things, things that it doesn't need to be doing. Okay, so having a look at the next example is uh, attacking phrases in other languages. So looking at phrases, there's various ways that we can create phrases. Um, there's some simple ways, for example, just uh, taking books, taking information from sites, grabbing the text from them, and basically cutting out sentences from there. Uh, that's one way you can do it as well. Some other ways are using the combinator tool. So basically combining um, certain elements, right? So for example, what you can do is have a, a pronoun word list and then have a noun word list, right? And then you combine the two with combinator so that you start making some kind of sentence. Or have a, a bunch of source words like I like, I hate, I do, I won't, etc. Combine those with a whole bunch of other standard words like I won't stand, I won't sit, I don't like this, etc., etc. to get those, uh, those phrases out. TMSS, the tool we discussed, also very good for uh, creating um, various kinds of uh, phrases as well. Um, remember what you can do in your word list too when you're combining them or using any of the tools is add a space um, either on the left or the right side of what you're combining if you want a sentence with a space in it instead of just uh, everything on one line. Um, generally, users will either just enter one phrase in one go, some of them may enter a space, but certain sites wouldn't, won't allow that. In which case, you don't need to worry about doing that. Right, then you can also use um, the combinator attack with the space as well to create sentences there. And then the Markov uh, attack is also very handy for doing that as well. How to use the Markov attack for creating sentences. Um, I'll leave it up to you to uh, um, look at what tools you want to use or uh, if you want to develop your, your own. What we have here are the engrams for the, from the Corpus of Contemporary American English. Okay, so top noun plus noun mark of chains. So basically what this tells us is that if you look at the word health, right, that's a very high frequency that the next word is going to be care after the word health, right. Looking at law, um, very high frequency that the next word will be enforcement. Now, if you go to the website and you scroll down, you will find the word law quite a few times, right? But what's going to change is the frequency or in the chain what statistically would be the next word after the word law. So you can then use this uh, as you want to customize your own tools to basically output uh, sentences from these Markov chains. Then attacking other lang languages. So uh, often you may find yourself faced with certain uh, hashes that need to be cracked that aren't in the English language. Now, if it's the English character set or the English alphabet, that's not too difficult. But you might find that you're getting ones that are in um, in Arabic, for example, maybe in emoji, maybe in Chinese, etc., and so on. So you want to be able to try and attack these as well. Now, obviously, first prize is to look for word lists that, that you can use along with the rules. But what you can do is you can also get Hashcat to brute force certain of these characters for you if you want to as well. And to do that, we used an option in Hashcat that uh, is called dash dash hex dash caraset. So that's basically telling Hashcat that instead of giving it just uh, characters, I'm giving them in hex. And the reason we do that is because, because in UTF-8, um, certain characters or the non-standard characters, these are represented in, in hexadecimal values as the Unicode. So if you click on that link there at that, um, at that table, it's a very nice website that, uh, that that person has set up there. 
you can basically look up all the characters that, that you want. It tells you what the, uh, the values are for, for those. So for example, if we look at uh, generating or brute forcing Arabic output, we can say, uh, okay, they have got an example of hashcat-m0, which is to attack md5, my hashes. And then what we're doing is, remember, we need the two uh, characters for the hex. So we're going to say that character 1, or dash 1, is either d8, d9, da, or db. Now remember, we've told hashcat that it's it's hexadecimal, so it's looking at that in pairs. It's not looking at it in characters. Remember to always add that switch, because if you don't, Hashcat's going to assume that you mean a D or an 8 or a D or a 9, which you don't want it to do in this case. So that's the base. Then dash 2 is telling us to add the next or the following uh, hexadecimal characters. And these are the ones that will basically change or that it will brute force through to give us the various outputs. And then we have the mask at the end, which is combining them 1 and 2, 1 and 2, 1 and 2, to output these. Um, the same thing with emoji. With emoji, just uh, one difference is that it's actually four um, of these hex characters that you need to put. So, for example, if we look at, uh, just switch out here. Might be a bit small. Let's see. Getting right. So if we are just uh, put it in a, in a script to make it easier to to run. So here, what 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 I've done is uh, let me first show you that file. Okay. Um, I don't know if you can read it. It's a bit small on the top there. Is it better now? But a bit better. I don't want to go too big. It's going to start cutting it off. Um, you can ignore the parts in the beginning. What's interesting now, what you want to focus on is that I've got those four preset characters I've given to Hashcat. Uh, F0, 9F, and 38, right? Which uh, tell us which are the hex for the uh, the emoji. Dash 4 is the one that's actually going to change. Now, I didn't include everything in there. You can get that from the website if you want to include it all. And I've told it to generate a, a um, that it's, it must view those as a, hexadecimal character set, and then I've told it to output there. So if you look, I'm going to output two emojis at a time, which is basically uh, two sets of four. So if we run that, we get uh, the output that's shown there. How many sorry, How many did I have? Did I have more than four? Yeah, sorry, I had three. So then you get uh, that output there. So that's one example of what you can do with that. If you look at that, at that table, you can basically output all sorts of characters, all sorts of uh, of languages, Greek, Chinese, Arabic, as I, as I mentioned, you can go on from there. Just keep in mind that uh, this is more last resort after a word list, or use it with a hybrid attack and add certain characters to a word list. Okay, because brute force, you generally want to be at the very end of, uh, I ran out of all ideas, and now I'm, I'm, I'm going to try and brute force something. Yeah, so that's how we can do that. And then um, also just keep in mind that when you're outputting this, just check that your hexadecimal values are correct. Because you may, if you make a mistake, you're not going to pick it up unless, because you won't be seeing what's coming out and what is not cracking. So my recommendation would be try and put into a file, script it, do something like that with it so that you've always got the same amount of data there. Okay, the next one is uh, the new WPA2 attack that uh, you may have heard about. And uh, it's, it's very interesting. It's very helpful. It's very nice. Um, courtesy of uh, Atom at Hashcat and also uh, Zero B for that. So what we have here is, an, is a new way to attack WPA2, which is uh, doesn't require us to have visibility of the client's handshake to the access point. So I'm sure many of you who have tried it um, it's, it's always a frustrating thing because you need to be in range of both. And if you're not, you land up having to walk around and uh, there's antennas facing all sorts of places. And you know, in the end, you're, you start looking quite conspicuous about what you're doing. With this new attack, you only need to have visibility of the, um, of the access point. And how it works is that it, it looks at a certain uh, packet in the, EA, in the EA pull frame called RNSIE or Robust Security Network information element. 
It's, uh, it uses, it looks at the pairwise master key, right? And in there, what was found was that it's, a, it's an HMAC SHA-1 hash using the, the pairwise master key as the key, and then the following data that it, uh, it does the run that hash on, which is the PMK name, the AP's MAC address, and the station's MAC, MAC address. With all of that, it then creates these, uh, let me just go back, sorry. It then creates these frames. Now from these frames, we can get everything we need to be able to attack the network without having to actually go and uh, get any clients or get any handshakes from that. So Atom very kindly put a new attack mode in and Zero B very kindly created or updated his tool, HCX dump tool. And uh, it works very well. I'll try and run it, but uh, I was trying to do it just now, but with all the Karma devices running around, the attacks are not looking very good because uh, it's, it's just messing up everything. So the, the screenshots are, uh, are sufficient. So what's happening here is we basically run it. We give it the output of a, uh, a PCAP file. Um, you give it an adapter, okay? And then you give it a uh, enable status one is basically just to show us when it has found a, a PMK ID that controls what kind of output comes out of there. So when I ran this, it, uh, it, it found certain handshakes and in some of them you'll notice that it found the PMK ID and that's the key of what we're looking for in order to be able to crack that uh, WPA2. So the next one, the HCX PCAP tool, uh, what that does is it reads the PCAP file and it dumps these PMK IDs for us in a format that Hashcat can use. So if you look at the bottom there, three of them were found. Um, just coming back to this one, it, it may take a while. Uh, also, the tool does have options to filter on uh, certain MAC addresses, so you, you're not just targeting everything in sight. If you don't want to do that, you can target specific MAC addresses, specific APs, and specific uh, channel numbers as well. It'll then dump these uh, PMK IDs that are written down. Um, I've used a very descriptive file name of blah. And uh, you simply then have a look inside there. And what you have in blah is this hash that's comprised of certain elements. You'll notice that the AP's MAC address is in there as well as, as the station. And then also um, a hex representation of the ESS ID. And the attack is uh, pretty simple after that. It's like you would have done with your WPA2 hashes in the past, except the new mode is 16800 that you'll give Hashcat. You'll feed it the uh, file that you just generated from that tool. And then uh, the W3 is just to control the workload. And then your word list or whatever attack you're gonna do. And what's gonna happen then, it's, it's gonna output. Now I've got it running um, on these. I don't think it finished yet, but I'll show you what it's doing. Thanks. Okay, so if you have a look at this one, it's still busy. It's still busy running the ones that I was trying to attack. Um, with certain access points, it may not work. Okay, so the one that I had that I was testing with, it didn't get it. It managed to get the uh, the PMK IDs of other access points. So you just need to give it some time, uh, play around with it until you get the output that you're looking for. But in this case, I've given Hashcat uh, that file, and it's busy trying to uh, to crack those those passwords over there. If I do a status printout, you'll see it changing and going on. So that's mode 16800 and uh, painfully easy to do. You just need to run the tool, have a Wi-Fi adapter of course that that's in monitor mode, get uh, the PMK IDs when they're dumped, convert them into a format Hashcat can use, run Hashcat with a particular word list or whatever your attack uh, is going to be and then it will give you the passwords once they are, they are, they are cracked. So. It doesn't, just keep in mind that if you're, I mean, if you're new to, to WPA2 cracking, it doesn't, 
it's not magically going to just spit out passwords. You still need to have word lists that, that are good. You still need to have attacks that are good at cracking these hashes. What it does that's very good now is that you don't need to be inside of the client capturing that handshake. You don't need to deauth clients and try and get those handshakes to come in. You just need to have your machine with your Wi-Fi adapter and visibility of the access points that you want to, uh, to attack. Um, cracking the heavy duty alg algorithms. So just a brief discussion on uh, how we can approach these algorithms that are very strong, that are very slow, especially salted ones, uh, especially ones that are uh, you're just finding that you're you're that you're not getting anywhere with them. Okay, Opt optimized word lists are are a must. Um, I think anybody speak to who cracks passwords will tell you that if your word lists are not good, you're going to go around in circles for a very long time. So you need to have word lists which are, are very precise, very scaled down, right? Remember, take away special characters because your rules are, are going to do that for you. You don't need them in there. You're just going to keep GPUs idling if you don't give them any, any, any work to do what you want to do with, with the rules. Keep brute forcing for the end, especially with slow algorithms, okay? With some of them, you're just wasting your time even trying to do a brute force because it's actually not going gonna, to gonna go anywhere. Profile the target as well. So, you know, if you're assuming that you're doing this as, as an audit, you know, think about what the person is doing. Are they filtering out leaked passwords like we discussed earlier? Are they, uh, what type of passwords would, would the users use? Is there a company name that I can, that I can use in a pattern or that I can feed in, into TMSs to start adding into my dictionary, for example? Uh, why would they pick certain pass passwords? And what enforcement does the company have on character size or the website have on character size? Uh, the, the password length, how short can it be, how long can it be, and so forth. Check if the GPU or CPU is being optimized, right? So if you notice that uh, John or Hashcat is showing you that not much is happening, okay, you've got six GPUs and one's doing the work, that isn't optimized. So you're doing something wrong, you need to change that especially on these slow algorithms, because you want to give as much power, you want to have everything working as hard as it can so that you, you get good use out of it. And then you use rules as well to create a workload. Right, so that brings me to the end of my part for today. I hope uh, it answered some questions. I do some interesting new attacks for the WPA that you can try. Uh, I just want to sh quickly... Um, show you where you can get those tools from. So, uh, in the internet's working. It looks like all the Karma devices have been turned off for a few seconds. Uh, okay, so here's uh, Zerbi's website which is with HCX dump tool. So you'll need this one to do the WPA attack. You're going to also need to get uh, HCX tools, which is right next to it, okay, and and compile these, of course, as well. Then you will need Hashcat, the latest version of Hashcat. If I can type it correctly, okay, so very simple. Just uh, go to the site there, and uh, I'd recommend perhaps fetching it from uh, from GitHub and compiling it. And then lastly. Um, if you need the steps to be re reiterated and uh, quite a good explanation of it as well. I just want to bring that up for you. Okay, so there's um, Atom's excellent article. He's, he's got links to the tools as well that you'll need um, to do that. So you can use that as well. And he also gives a very good description of how um, of what it's doing along with the actual packet capture and then also the steps that you need to do that. So how to defend against this um, is uh, as it was with WPA with the other attack act actually as well um, was to have Wi-Fi passwords that that are, are secure, that are long, that are complex, that are difficult to crack, or switch to a different authentication mechanism like a managed authentication instead of a pre-shared key on the clients. But if you can't do that, you need to make sure that it's, it's quite, uh, that it's quite a secure password. Just also note that you need certain adapters for this to work, right? It's not just going to work on 
um, like a like a Max Wi-Fi adapter or most Wi-Fi adapters out there. So, on I think on uh, Zerbi's website there, he did show which adapters it's known to work with. Um, or if you do have one that you have been using to capture handshakes, try it anyway on on that. Um, for example, the TP-Link I've got was not listed as being supported, but it does work on there too. So I'm sure he he will just keep on adding the supported adapters as as time goes on. Uh, right. Okay, and that's the end of the show. So if you have any any questions afterwards, you're welcome to uh, come up here. I don't want to keep uh, everybody from those who need to, to go to lunch, so you're welcome to come up to the front and I'll uh, answer any questions that, that you may have. Thank you.